So like most modern comedians, you took the university route. I've interviewed a whole range of comedians from a variety of different backgrounds. Some have come up through the club circuit while others have adopted the academic approach. What did university offer you, which you then used as a springboard to your success? Great question. Um, I'm trying to say that succinctly, but I've always loved performing. I think because I'm a massive attention seeker. <laughs> and at A level, I did drama and theatre. And I, it was my secret dream to become an actor. But I knew if I went down the drama school route, um, the roles for disabled actors weren't there. Actually, they're still not there right now. Yeah. So yeah. I decided to be a sneaky bugger and study English because my thinking was English is such a varied cost. If I came to the end of it, I thought, no, I want to do something else. English would help me do that. And growing up, not seeing myself on telly or disabled people in the media, at all, I thought a better way to make a difference is to study English and then go round the back and work in production. So, yeah, there weren't disabled roles. Yeah, they weren't disabled people on TV shows or panel shows. So I thought, if I get an English degree and get in telly, I can make a difference. And I did, and I worked as a researcher um, behind TV shows for five years and I loved it but there was always that, that person at the back of my head going you want to be on telly, you want to be on stage. So that is when I slipped into stand up comedy, but I have no regrets because actually that degree and those five years working behind the camera yeah. have given me the tools, the knowledge, the experience to know what to do in this new comedy world. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Oh, just out of interest, how did you get on with drama A-level? Oh, 
my god, I'm so glad you match. Right. I got full marks for two years. <laughs> um so when I went to school you couldn't get a stash. But yeah, I got an A. So <laughs> big drama <laughs> queen. <laughs> uh, okay, the next question I'm about to ask, I pre warn you, these are Josh's words, not mine. Just keep that in mind, okay? Uh, Francesca Martinez and Lawrence Clark remain the contemporary pioneers of disabled people in comedy. How important are these figures in raising awareness that spastics can be funny? Are you sure that wasn't your? <laughs> It's nothing to do with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a voice. It's him. <laughs> um. Well, yeah, they've been incredibly important. And growing up and in my teenage years, people like Francesca and Lawrence were the only disabled people I saw on telly and at this is not a bad thing it is not but when I did see them on TV they were always talking about their disability and I think that's because they had to, like they were the only disabled person on anything and they were kind of expected to be that disabled one talking about disabled matters. Um, thinking about where we are 10, 20 years on, I really hope we've moved forward and we got a lot more brilliant disabled comedians out there, like lots of voice guy and Chris McCausland. And I, I really hope that, like for example me, when I'm on a TV show or a panel show, I talk about my disability if it comes up, mm -hmm. if I want mm -hmm. to. Yeah. And that's a shift yeah. now. Yeah. I sometimes do a TV show or a stand-up set and I don't even mention my cerebral palsy because I hope mm. that they now book me to be a comedian yeah, and see. not mm. the disabled <laughs> one. Yeah. So Lawrence and Francesca for sure paved the way so that people like me can now come on and go, yeah, I'm disabled. But there's also a million different Uber parts mm -hmm. of me. And I hope that the newer comedians after me can also build on what we've started and hopefully in 10, 20 years there'll be a, a lot more disabled comedians 
Bob B. Dan zijn boten mede en zo. Dus naar de mensen dat de zijboot. Het is een Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not. Oi, oi, hey, oi, hey, oi, um, yeah josh is a firm believer of that too and like as soon as you mention it like that's it it's it's just brought up isn't it and no one can steer away from it sort of thing yeah yeah Yeah. and then there's uh, too much focus on it when it doesn't need to be just like you said it's completely separate Mm. yeah yeah Yeah. and then also it's up to us whether we talk about it the power Mm -hmm. should really be with us yeah (coughs) and i don't know yeah, yeah. Josh was just saying as well, uh, <laughs> just because he's disabled, it doesn't make him an expert on it either. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and also we cannot speak for all disabled people. We just speak for us and our experiences. got their own like concept on disability and who who are who's josh and who yourself like to tell people and to dictate people like oh this is how it is you know for us and yeah yeah hundred percent oh my god i could speak about this for hours yeah (laughs) yeah but you'll miss out on your carbonara later yeah Uh, another relevant question coming up now how important is it for comedians like yourself to make light of diversity in the 21st century oh well again that's a good one um it's important and it's not so it's important because we still live in a world where um, society is a little afraid about diversity and mm-hmm. I still come across people every day who patronise me or feel sorry for me. So me making light of being disabled is so important because I want to get the message out there that I'm just like 
everyone else and should not be treated any differently. <laughs> so for sure, comedy is a great way to break down barriers and to go with just human beings. But on the other side, that you can't make light of serious things like during the pandemic at the beginning, six in ten people who died from COVID had a disability. Mm -hmm. You can't make light on the fact that if you're disabled in the UK, you're twice as likely to be unemployed. I can't make jokes about that. I don't want to take that lightly. However, there's a way um, to use that in my comedy to make sure people are aware that in the UK at the moment under this current government, it is shit to be disabled. So (laughs) comedy as that double-ended thing of I can be light and go out there and say being disabled is amazing. You can dribble on everyone, but it's a quite light and flipping and just yeah. me saying the joy in disability. But if I have a longer set of a longer show, I'm able to bring that darkness in for a moment and go, I get verbally abused in the street regularly. I've missed out on jobs because of how I speak. I get patronised on a daily basis. And those are messages that society need to be aware of in order to change and be better and be more accepting um, but it's how to say that and then finish on a little joke yeah. so I really yeah. hope I use that lightness and shade in order that yeah. your average audience member would leave my show and go, oh great, I've laughed for 56 minutes. My belly absolutely hurts. But actually, yeah, I didn't know how bad it is for disabled people right now. So you're laughing and you're learning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, and, uh, mm-hmm.
Josh just wants to ask something, but he doesn't want to go off two subjects. And you might look at him and think he's mental, but. I have been uh, Josh is a bit of a budding comedy historian and he was just wondering if you didn't if you knew anything about the writer Johnny Spate. No, no, I don't <laughs> Uh, he wrote till uh, dare fast do part. receive a lot of backlash at the time with the, the way he wrote the program but uh, obviously he was trying to do it in a satirical but, way uh, in regards to discrimination If you were to do anything similar to that now, that sort of show, would there be a similar reaction? Would there be backlash? It's interesting because actually I had to watch to death do was part a few years ago. And I get that. And it's interesting that that. Alf Garnet character is the only racist person in the show. And actually, when you analyse a lot of the jokes, they're at Alf's expense. Like, nobody is agreeing with him. But maybe that's a personal opinion. I, although I understand that, um, it never sat right with me. And I, even though it's clearly a character, I they didn't want to listen to a character who said yeah. things like that. So for sure, if a program like that happened today, it might be satirical and it might be incredibly clever and nuanced, but my concern would be the group of society who don't understand that nuance 
as in um, to deck the rules, but there would have been a certain proportion of people who enjoyed it because they agreed with Alf. And I think if you make a show like that again, although it might be trying to do the right thing, I would fear that it would encourage more hate. Yeah. If you look at the yeah. country we live in right now, yeah. There's a lot of people who wouldn't understand that nuance and they would just get on board with that hate. So it might um, go in our opposite favour. It's like the persona I play on stage is me but it's a lot more confident me it's a lot more sexual me I'm a bit of a bully on stage because right now I think we need diverse characters <laughs> to be the main character and to own it and to go, don't you fucking dare feel sorry for me because I'm cool and sexy, I'm so such for I own you. I can take even though you're a white, straight, able bodied man, I can take you down and I can make this whole room of people pity you because I'm in control yeah. and I think yeah. you need more characters mm -hmm. like that right now to switch people's thinking. Um, I think that is a lot more beneficial than, say, a to death for the world part type show that because we're comedy nerds, we understand that nuance, but I don't think the majority of the country would. Yeah. I agree. Josh agrees. Hey, and uh, consider me petrified. I might have to leave. You secured a researcher role for Channel 4. How important was this in getting you comfortable with the disciplines of television? Oh, so important. And I was able to work on a lot of panel shows for all channels. So I did eight out of ten cats. Would I lie to you? And all the brilliant Harry, her, Harry Hill panel shows. And that was so important because it meant that I was by the cold fate and knew how panel shows worked and knew how they set people up and book people 
and you how studio day to work and then I knew how the edit worked so it meant that when I started going on shows I didn't have those nerves because it was an environment that I was already incredibly comfortable with and now that it's not comedians against production really the producers are on your side and they want the comedians to come out as the best and the funniest so I feel that comedians who don't have that experience when it's their first time on a panel show, they're a little bit intimidated and a little bit quiet because they worry that they won't be funny and I've unfortunately seen it loads of times that a brilliant comedian comes on says a joke the audience don't go for it and then they go in themselves and they're, they're quiet for the rest of the show and you can't do that because actually the reality is if you tell a joke and the, the audience don't laugh that won't be in the show that'll be cut mm. so then it's up to you to try again give another joke and if you relentlessly pop out four, five, six jokes, three or four will land. Three or four will get great reactions. And that's all the producers need in the edit. So when it comes to telly, the audience just see that everything you say is funny. So it's little tips like that that I learned from being a researcher. So Oh, and also people being a researcher means that everyone I worked with in those five years are now producers and execs. So basically, when I go on a panel show, I have a lovely time because the producers and directors and floor managers, they're all my friends. Yeah. They're all people I used to work with. So I think people find that annoying because people are like, Shit, we need to get Rosie into makeup, but to walk those five minutes, she's bound to come across eight of her friends and talk away. <laughs> I can't go anywhere 
on a TV show without having a good old letter. <laughs> It was around this time that you toured with stand-up comedy from talking to other comedians on the circuit. Despite being a supportive community, the open mic circuit can often be extremely unpredictable and soul-destroying for many comedians. How did this boisterous audience react when faced with a figure like yourself? Um, it's interesting. Starting now, um, I always make sure that I start in my set with four or five one-liners. So, for example, my old opening line was, as you can tell from my voice, I suffer from being open <laughs> and it's <laughs> lines like that that really help me for a number of reasons one they're very quick that and as a slow talker I couldn't make my opening joke long because I would lose the crowd immediately. I needed to make them laugh very quickly. Yeah. But also those quick one-liners meant that they could get used to how I speak. So I could do quick joke, quick joke, quick joke, quick joke. And by then, they knew I was funny. They knew they didn't have to be awkward around its ability mm -hmm. and they could understand my speech. So after four quick jokes, the audience would then go with me if I told a longer joke or a longer story. So when I was on the open mic circuit, I had that routine and what's interesting now is I don't need to do that as much because when I go on stage now, people seem to know me. They don't feel that awkwardness as much. But I've still got to do it to a certain extent. Um, and then... George, when I think about the open mic circuit, I was pretty relentless. When you think about the fact that at the time, I was still working in telly, so I was still working 9am to 6pm on a panel show and then four, five times a, a week I would then go out and i do a gig for no money to about four people. But I did that to build up my stamina and to hone who I was. So 
would I want to go back to the open mic circuit now? Absolutely not. <laughs> but I needed that. I needed that challenge and that relentlessness in order to become a better comedian. You made your panel show debut on 8 out of 10 Cats. How daunting was it to be surrounded by sharp comic minds like Jimmy Carr? It is. It's very sharp. Um, it was daunting. It was scary, but like I said before, luckily I worked on eight out of ten cats for nearly a year. So I knew Jimmy, I knew the show, I knew the producers, and it. I sound like an arrogant prick, but I really didn't feel super nervous because I knew that we filmed for three hours for a 40 minute show and I knew that the edit will be lovely and out of any panel show I am so glad that was my first one because they really looked after me and it felt like a special moment to be on a show that I'd worked on a year previously. Yeah. The first time I was aware of your work was on the Dave panel show, Hypothetical. When speaking to other comedians on the subject of panel shows, a certain amount of care is given to ensure everyone gets the opportunity to contribute to proceedings. To what extent do you need to make extra effort to ensure that your contribution is heard? Well, it really depends on the show and the host. So someone like Jimmy Carr, is, in my opinion, the best host out there. I don't know how he does it, but he's always aware that they have been spoken for seven minutes. They're looking like they want to say something. And if I ever do a panel show with Jimmy Carr, he will always, always, always say, Rosie, what do you think? And it gives me the chance to say a joke. Other panel shows, not the week are harder to do that to because they were not the week was grown in an environment that was very masculine and very competitive. So when I did Mark the Week, it was very hard to get in because everyone's written um, five pages of jokes. So mm -hmm. then there's that awful feeling of seven comedians are all fighting to tell their joke. So 
and a joke about allowance space for everyone and allowing the conversation to open up because a show like Hypothetical is one of my favourite shows to do because you don't have that competition. It's more of a conversation. Um, and personally, when I watch a comedy show or a panel show, I don't want to see comedians going at each other and vying for their spots. I prefer when somebody tells a joke and then the other comedian laughs and builds on from that joke. So it can be hard, but luckily I'm very loud and when I need to be, I'm very aggressive. So I make myself hurt. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, in, in October 2021, you were at the centre of a bizarre sequence of events when you appeared on BBC One's Question Time. Unlike most people, I wasn't so much outraged, but confused as to what the issue was. On reflection, what was your take on it? Um, so I got abuse while going on question time. And a lot of the abuse was about my disability and my appearance, oh, also my gender. So they threw me being a woman in there as well. And it confused me too, because I've gone on question time the year before, and I got a sprinkling of abuse, but not to that level. Um, and I don't really know why I got that much abuse. I think it's because Question Time is a political show. I went on there and gave my political opinion. And it doesn't surprise you that I'm very left. Yeah. I vote for Labour, I always have. So I went on that show and I think I was very liberal and very left-leaning and some right-wing people uh, disagreed with me, which is fine. Everyone's open to their own opinion, but instead of challenging what I said or saying I don't agree with her, they took the cheap easy, dirty way of resorting to abuse. Yeah. And unfortunately, we've seen this time and time again. A key one last year was the Football Euro final of when we were winning, everyone was celebrating. 
Scotland with lots of penalty shootout. Everyone resorted to racism. Mm. And that's a horrible thing about society right now. If somebody is sad or angry or doesn't agree with you, instead of coming to me with a healthy challenge, they resorted to what I look like and what I sound like. So, I think that's what happened, but it didn't upset me. It was just more of a we better than this. Yeah. We should be better than this. And <laughs> actually, it made me more determined to get out there and speak my opinions because it just highlighted all the narrow-minded people in the country. So Josh was saying that um, if I was if like a couple of years ago, maybe there was a shift in, you know, how people are seeing things. And uh, but like with the football, for example, the whole, you know, the racism row keeps on going on. Take the knee became a huge thing, still is. And if anything, that's brought up even more discrimination and more hate. And it's divided people again when it was supposed to obviously do something positive. Yeah. God, Still a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough hours in the day to talk about it. <laughs> Is that, uh, looking back at your career, what's been your proudest achievement? Oh, I think a few years ago I performed at Wembley Arena and that was that made me so proud on so many levels. Firstly, to go out there and to say, hello, Wembley, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're the <laughs> dreams. Yeah. And also it was, very special for me because my mum and dad came and my best friend. So it was the um, first big thing I did where all my loved ones <laughs> were there and they could really see me achieve something 
properly brilliant in the comedy world. So yeah, that is still my proudest achievement. Brilliant. And um, Josh always finishes off with this question. So uh, apart from going on a lovely long walk in a moment, what's next for Rosie Jones? Oh, you're more of the same. I feel like it's cliche, but I'm living the bloody dream. Um, <laughs> I just finished writing my second children's book. So that'll be out in August. And then more gigging, more TV shows, and then hopefully next year, the big one, I, I think I'm going on a big UK tour. So that'll mm -hmm. be really good for mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. More of the same, and I'll be a very happy lady. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Is that your first tour? Will that be your first big UK yeah, tour? Yeah. I've, I've supported people. I've supported Nish Kumar, Joe Lysett, Josh Whittaker. But I haven't ever done my own one, so yeah. that'll be great fun. Yeah, amazing, amazing. <laughs> you know where you're going yet? Any specific? So, basically, I'll go wherever my age <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it'll be all over, so that'll be great fun. Will, will you add the Isle of Wight to that list? Any chance? Yes, of <laughs> course. <laughs> I'm, I'm when you we really able to do this again. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Uh, if you do come to the Isle of Wight, we may be, be able to do this in person and have a chat in person. I would love that. I really, really love that. So yeah. Hopefully, beginning of next year, Isle of Wight in person, yeah. we will we'll spend hours put in the water right. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, uh, any other, anything else? Yeah. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. And I hope you have a lovely day. <laughs>